Welcome to the Power of Your Voice podcast with your host, Johnny Gorky. You have the power to overcome challenges and fears. Let my voice and the voice of many others show you how to transform these challenges into opportunities. To learn more about future podcasts and read episode show notes, check out my website at www.thepowerofyourvoice.com. Welcome to episode 48. Entering college, Will Moore was your typical victim. He was convinced the world was out to get him and there was nothing he could do about it. A serendipity event in one of his college classes would change his life forever, beginning his journey to determine what it truly means to be happy. Years later, he can proudly say he's the owner of his life. Who knows, there's literally nothing that can stop him. Obstacles are only temporary roadblocks waiting for solutions. Like everyone, he has his strengths and weaknesses, but unlike most, he learned how to focus solely on his strengths and find work around his weaknesses to ensure gaining momentum every single day. This past year, one of his businesses sold for a combination of $323 million. You heard that. A combined $323 million dollars surpassing the goal he set for himself. Ironically, in having success in his career and finances, he learned what true happiness was really all about. It's about continually building momentum and maintaining balance in what William calls your five cores. It turns out, finding success as an entrepreneur in the career and finance core is just one part of the equation, one-fifth to be exact. To be truly successful involves becoming an entrepreneur, owner, or leader of the most important business he ever ran, his life. And like all businesses, to find success requires nurturing the key elements of that business. But instead of marketing, accounting, human resources, etc., in real life, these are our five cores which include mindset, career, finances, relationships, physical health, and emotional health and giving back. William Moore calls these the five cores. The only way to build serious momentum in life is to shine a spotlight in each and to use a system to stop the failure habits that are killing us and replace them with success habits. Hey, well, welcome to the Power Your Voice podcast, man. It's great to have you on here today. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. I am definitely excited to be here. You're very welcome. Now, I I think something that's very important for some people, you're a very successful business guy. But at the same time, sometimes there's a misconception, like people assume, well, you know, he probably had a wonderful childhood. His mom and dad stayed married for 20, 30, 50, 100 years. And, you know, he was very privileged and had a lot of mentors and just life was always peaches and cream, but that wasn't your case. So can you dig in a little bit deep into your background and how your childhood was as a kid? Yeah, no, that definitely was not the case with me. So um, I, in, in the book that I'm writing, uh, I can talk about, and I've, I've got I've had some speeches and presentations that I've discussed, and it's something that I used to be very ashamed of, but that I'm very proud of now. And I actually know that if I didn't have the past that I had and the tough upbringing, that I would definitely not be the person that I am today. And I think it's also helped not only push me to become successful in traditional kind of money sense, but in all these other areas and these cores, which we'll talk about tonight. Um, but yeah, so the, the gist of it is I was born to two hippie parents in Ca- Pasadena, California. <laughs> I then was, uh, my mom was an army brat. So my, my, my mom actually came from, they both came actually from very straight laced, normal families. Um, not that hippies aren't normal, but your traditional, I should say, families. And my dad became a hippie and kind of rebelled and, and went on his own. And then he met my mom and kind of like pulled her and was like, this is the life. This is cool. And so, but she came from, uh, my grandfather was a general in World War II, very military. They moved around a lot. But one place they were stationed was Hawaii. And so they were, when they were hippies and they were like, okay, where are we going to live? It was sort of like, well, Hawaii sounds like a cool place. And my mom's like, I live there. It's cool. So we actually moved there. So the first five or six, seven years of my life were actually pretty cool. Um, I loved it. I was this long haired hippie kid just running around. We were the only white kids in our school. We were, there were uh, a bunch of locals and they called us Howleys is what they actually called us. 
uh, which is kind of a funny, interesting term. It means white outsiders kind of. So it was, we, we, you know, that was interesting. And I kind of didn't realize that we were different until I looked back and I put some things together. But when you're a kid, you know, you're just playing with everybody and whatnot. But by the time when I did move to, we moved to DC, but that's the Maryland, my parents got divorced. And then that's when things kind of started getting a little rocky because I, I was just not your typical kid. Like I said, I had children like hair and I had this like pigeon accent from Hawaii and I just was not accepted. And my confidence just completely, you know, I was just kind of, that was, that's the age when you're in those formidable, malleable years, you're figuring out who you are and you're gaining confidence or losing it. And I just lost all mine because I just was um, picked on and teased and I looked different. I talked different. My name was Rocky at the time because my parents were heavy. So my, my sister was Puff Sun Pat Moore was her name. And my name was Rocky Clay Thomas Wooten Moore. So that means you're strong, okay. right? <laughs> well, ironically, you know, that's what got me in te- teased because the movie came out the same year I was born. My parents claimed no correlation. They're like, oh, that's just a coincidence. I'm like, I guarantee you were smoking a joint. You saw the preview on TV and you're like, that would be a good thing for our son. But anyway, so they uh, put, you know, so I was in this environment where it was like, oh, come on, Rocky, you want to fight? You want to, you want to go? And I was like, this, you know, no, I don't, I don't want to fight anybody. So this, you know, flash forward to college. I just, my, we, we then ended up, I transferred to a few different schools in high school. I was like, completely unhappy i transferred literally my senior year that's how unhappy i was from my public high school to a private high school to live with my dad because my mom and i were fighting all the time i had no friends in school and so i kind of looked at college as a fresh start and i got to college and then i call it my rock bottom bounce where i kind of basically reached where i said okay i'm either going up or down and there's really nowhere down to go other than to kill myself and I didn't really want to do that and but I just was so unhappy that I just was kind of like I call it my rock bottom you know I was just hovering right there and then I serendipitously was turned on to a self-help book uh, by one of my professors who I really admired and it was called how to win friends and influence people which you may have heard of it's one of the more very, popular very books yes uh, I've since read it 10 times it's one of my favorite all-time books uh, but it turned me into this like insatiable self-help beast and i became this just monster of like okay there's hope there's a different way to look at the world i'm going to reinvent myself and i'm going to become a completely different person and so flash forward another 25 years you know it's been one step at a time i, I just was constantly reading self-help books i was using myself as a human science experiment and just really kind of figuring out what worked for me, what I felt worked in the universe, putting it all together, taking notes along the way. And then I've kind of landed here. That, you, you, you have definitely an amazing story. I, I did that reinvention and, and I, I, had, I had business success. I sold my business. I exited last year. Um, we sold for a combined $323 million. And I thought when I was younger and I was reinventing myself, I thought that's all that I needed and that's all I wanted. And I thought if I could just do that, if I could become ridiculously wealthy that everybody i'd make everybody sorry and everybody would be like oh my god i can't believe we were mean to him did it work he's he's, he's, (laughs) obviously he's got something he's so successful and but along the way in the journey i realized that's actually not what it's about that's one piece of the equation your career and your finance which i call one of these five cores but there's also your relationships there's your physical health there's your mindset there's your emotional health and your giving back and if you don't have everything if you're not firing on all cylinders no matter how much money you get, trust me, I'm, I'm your perfect uh, example. It, it will not bring you happiness. It, it will feel really great for 10 seconds. And then all of a sudden it'll be like, okay, now what? Right. And so you got to have all of it going. And so that's kind of what my whole mission is about now is helping people understand what it really means to be happy. Um, the entrepreneur part is a part of it. And I like to help people become an entrepreneur of their life because that's the most important business they'll ever run. And so it's about helping them discover what it takes to run that business just like any business you've got your human resources your marketing your accounting in your life you've got these five cores and you need to continually cultivate them work on them make sure that you're spending the time to grow them and then that's how you'll be the person that you want to end up as now i wanted to go into your five cores but first one of the things i wanted to go into a little bit is like how how did you get started in business because i know once you graduated school you co-founded a company 
how did you get exactly started? Because not everybody, once they graduate school, sometimes they don't, they don't even have the focus idea of what they sure. want. Sure, and I was right there with them. So if anybody's in that boat right now, do not worry. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do other than I knew that I wanted to be my own boss. I got fired from just about every job that I ever worked for. Uh, I got fired from my waitering job, from my, um, I worked at a Smoothie King. I got fired within like a week because I wouldn't clean the toilets. Uh, not that I'm like this person, but I was like, the guy's like, here, clean that poop up. I'm like, I'm not doing that. That's not what I signed up for. So bottom line is I knew I wanted to be my own boss and it was a journey. So at first I started in real estate. And I kind of, that's where I got my feet wet in business. And I started my own company with that. I actually started a business where I was buying houses and renting them out to students because I lived in Florida at the time and my alma mater was right there. And I saw this need for all these college kids that were graduating or even still in school and there wasn't enough housing. So I found a niche with that. And then um, at some point I was working for a company where we were trapped in an office for 10, sometimes 15 hours a day. And we did not have good food and the only food options we had was pizza and chinese which was your traditional that's usually up until about 10 years ago when we started our business uh you could order and so i said you know what i know that there's something there's got to be a solution there's got to be a way that somebody like me can get sushi can get thai food can get a salad if i want it and there wasn't and i thought this is ridiculous so i actually quit my job at real estate and I started this company called Doorstep Delivery, which was your favorite restaurants delivered to your doorstep. And this was before Grubhub. This was before Uber Eats. This was before DoorDash. None of those had even, were even a twinkle in the owner's eyes yet. I mean, I think at the time those kids were probably like 15 years old because I'm, I'm now, I just turned 44. Um, we started this business when I was about 31 or so. And those guys are the, like the Grubhub CEO. I think he's only like 32. So what, what, he was maybe 12. <laughs> so, and it was right around the time when cell phone, it was, it was very good timing for us. Uh, we got fortunate. Cell phones were just coming out. So we started taking all of our orders over the phone, right? And our dispatchers were literally like reading instructions on a map to our drivers, telling them how to get to where they were going. But very quickly, the GPSs were integrated into the phone so drivers could see where they were going on their phone. We could send them the order through text. Customers started ordering online instead of calling their orders in. And it was just like a very good timing situation to where we then took advantage of that and we created our own software and we made it into something. And we were the first ones in into a lot of these markets. We were the largest restaurant delivery service in the Southeast and we grew from one tiny little branch in Orlando, Florida to 19 branches. And so by the time Grubhub and these companies did open up, we'd already had a pretty good stronghold, but we couldn't fight billions of dollars. So, you know, we were, we bootstrapped it ourselves. You know, we did it with our own. We basically didn't eat, we were eating ramen and, and peanut butter for, for years, basically just trying to survive and, 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 you know, make a profit. And then we finally did start making a profit. And then these big companies came around and they're like, okay, well, we're just going to squash you like a bug. And we're basically going to work with these restaurants. We're going to do it for free. We're going to give the customers pretty much free food. We're going to give the restaurants commission free for a year. And we're just going to put you out of business. And so uh, we were like, oh my God, it was the worst feeling in the world because I saw the writing on the wall, just like I did years ago with real estate, right before the real estate market crashed. And I got into doorstep delivery. I meant, I forgot to mention that, by the way. So when I was doing the real estate stuff, the real estate market crashed a year later, right, as I transitioned into doorstep delivery. But because I, I, I kind of saw, I, it was such a frenzy. And I was like, this can't last forever. I need to get the hell out of here. So similar, fortunate, I was able to see kind of a pattern and, and what was happening. And so I reached out to this other company, this guy that I knew that had a similar size company. I said, hey, man, do you want to merge and, and try to grow and compete against these guys? So that's what we did. And we raised funding and then we grew and we acquired other companies in our markets that were, we, we were like the tier two and tier three cities, right? So we weren't like the big New Yorks and the LAs and the Chicagos. We were like the Orlandos and the Tampas and the Nashvilles. So we were able to develop that niche in a secondary market. And kind of when you're in first, you have a big advantage. And so they were actually having a hard time competing with us, even though they had all this money. Um, and then we eventually ended up selling last year to a company out of Louisiana called Waiter Holdings. That's really good. Well, and well, one thing I always wonder is like, do you think it's a good idea to start a business with the intention to one day sell it? Because you do see a lot of entrepreneurs, they start a business, they might run it for a couple of years, and then eventually they do sell it. 
which allows you to do all these other things, but you can't do these other things unless you have a substantial amount of capital. Like for example, Tom, what's his name? Tom Anderson, who started my MySpace back in the days. I think he sold it to Time Warner, I think for like, what was it, like $500 million or something. It was a ridiculous amount of money. Now the guy's like a traveling photographer. And I think that's all he does. He has an amazing life. But some people, that's what they do. They start businesses to sell them and then they have other businesses as well that they eventually do later. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, you know, everybody does start businesses. For To me, if you're going to be successful at something, you have to really be passionate and love what you're doing, right? It's got to be, um, that's your thing. And so I, I, I wasn't passionate about restaurants, but I was passionate about business. I was passionate about working with people, figuring out ways to make money. I liked a challenge. And boy, was this a challenging business. Because when you talk about customers that are pissed when they don't get their food, part of my line, which uh, you know, upset when they don't get their food. You're dealing with drivers who they're living day to day sometimes, and these are independent contractors, and so they, you can't tell them what to do. And so you're hoping that they do what they're supposed to with their orders, and sometimes they don't show up, and then all of a sudden it's like a rainy night when we're busiest. And you know, at one point in Orlando, we had like a hundred drivers on the road at one time, and we started with I was the driver and my my business partner. We started that way. We were the two, and then at one point we got to about a hundred. But then on a rainy night, you know, we need one hundred and fifty drivers, and if like ten percent of our workflow didn't call in and didn't want to come to work that day, so we had like eighty or ninety drivers. All of a sudden, we got a major problem because we got way too many orders that we could handle, and people are getting their food late they're getting some of you know sitting at the restaurant it's cold we're trying to call and, and do damage control but there's only so much we so many resources we had in our, our dispatcher so we realized we couldn't scale at a certain point and that's when we ended up transitioning to partner with the other company yeah well i i think too yeah the good thing is just time in the markets you're like okay well this is a need okay well i can see things are changing let's sell the business and let's get into something else and you you did a really good job with that with the transition. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. And then again, I, we were very fortunate um, timing wise, you know, and now Uber Eats and, and Grubba there, I see them, they're all battling it out for this food delivery space. They all want to be the top dog. Uh, DoorDash is losing. I mean, they're all losing tons of money, right? And you got to remember, we were doing, we were actually making a profit. So that's when I knew, I was like, I can't compete with a business that their business model is to lose money to gain market share. And that's exactly what all these companies are doing right now. They're just losing money to try to grow. And so that's why we said, okay, we, we better get out fast. So we were fortunate enough to exit when we did. If you think about it in a perfect world, I mean, it's a great concept because it's a triple win. It's your business. That's a win for you. It's a win for the restaurants because they get extra business that they wouldn't get otherwise. So that's a double win. And then the people who are delivering they need extra income. Probably a lot, a lot of them are like single parents or they're college students and they're looking for extra income. So it's a triple win for everybody. If the concept works, you don't have people who are late or you don't have drivers who are probably eating the food or something. Ooh, that smells good. Let me have a bite. <laughs> if you don't have any of those kind of issues, I mean, it could probably be a great concept. It's funny you say that. That's how we would describe it. When we would go to, to talk to restaurants, um, we would say, look, this is really is a win-win. And it was because like you, you were saying, these restaurants want extra business, right? And they've got their food cost, they've got their labor, and they've got their overhead. So their labor, it is what it is. They've got their people that are working there. They've got the cooks in the kitchen, they've got the people and the staff and to-go staff, and they've got their waiters who are usually independent contractors. Then the, the overhead is fixed as well. That's their rent, their utilities. It is what it is. They, that doesn't ever change. The thing that does, and then they've got their food costs which is basically usually somewhere around 30% of, of their, their total operating margins. And so essentially what we would do is say, okay, look, your rent and your overhead are fixed costs. And let's call those, usually it's about 30% rent, overhead, 30% labor, and then 30% food costs. So those are all fixed costs. That's a 90%. So they're making 10% on their orders. But then when we would actually send them an order, they would make more money because the labor and the overhead were already fixed. So they were paying those whether we brought them in order or not. We brought them an incremental extra sale they wouldn't have had. And the only cost that it cost them was that food cost at 30%, right? And so we would get our commission. They would still, you know, and, and, and basically the only time it didn't make sense for us to work with the restaurant is that they were literally so busy in their own space that they couldn't handle the volume coming in. 
Because then it's like, okay, well, now you're dipping into our pockets and you're taking money out where we would be serving other customers. But normally that's not how it works, right? Normally restaurants have plenty of staff to be able to feed way more people than are actually in the restaurant. And so that was why it was such a great win-win because we would come in and say, hey, here's extra orders to make sure that your, your cooks are staying busy. You know, you're getting extra food out. Plus it's advertising for the restaurant. Somebody might go online and see their restaurant and order from them from us and they may not have ever even been in there and they may love the food and then they may actually go in and dine it as well. Oh, exactly. And, and especially maybe you have somebody who's sick and they can't go to a restaurant or something. It's great that they're able to get food to go. Now, well, one of the things I know on your website, you're talking about hitting rock bottom. Like what's a few times in your life where you experienced hitting rock bottom and what lessons did you learn through those experiences? Good question. So, you know, that, that college, you know, situation, like I told you, that was like my, my, my true rock bottom where it was kind of like, I'm either going up or I ain't going anywhere. And so I was fortunate enough to read that book at the right time. And it started this journey for me. And I just have every day since then said, okay, how do I become bigger, better, faster, stronger? What, you know, what books can I read? What things can I do? And I've just been using myself as a human science experiment and taking notes along the way, what works, what doesn't. And so that's where this all has culminated for me with this book and this app that I'm doing. It's essentially taking all this information that I have gained and that I've used to help me. And now I have two small little sons that I want to help as well. And so if nothing else, it's going to be for them, but hopefully other people will enjoy it and read it and use the app as well to help them, um, you know, stop these failure habits that they develop and pivot into these success habits to replace them. So really since hitting that rock bottom in college, I haven't had any other rock bottoms, but what I have had is a ton of failures. And I now, the difference between old will and new will, old will before rock bottom and will after, is I now am at a point where I literally welcome failures. It, trust me, it doesn't feel good sometimes. I mean, you know, it stings for a second, but then if you have that mindset that immediately, okay, not only is this something that is not so bad. It's actually mandatory in life. You have to fail to grow. And so it's like, if I don't have this failure and if I don't learn a lesson, I'm not going to grow and I'm not going to continue to become the person that I want to be and, and to keep headed and you know, gaining that momentum. And so now it's like failures are opportunities versus in the past. It was like, I'm a failure because I failed, right? There's a huge difference there. And it's all about the mindset, which is the first core. You learn a lot from failures. I was talking to a friend, a friend of mine. He has a son. When they first moved in their house, their son, he signed up for a basketball team. He's young. He's probably like nine years old at the time. And he's like the first three years, every single year, they won first place. And he got so used to always winning. He didn't learn anything. But one year, the fourth year, he lost and he felt so bad. But he learned so much by that one failure. I mean, that's the thing. If, if you always win, 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 you don't really learn and grow. That's... That, that, that's well said. That's exactly right. It's funny. There's something to that whole uh, old adage, you know, the, the football high school star ends up pumping gas, you know, uh, it, it, you know, years later. And I think part of that is when you have everything handed to you and everything comes easily and, you know, it's like, okay, you go through life and you're the good looking one and you're the, the smart one and you're the good athlete. And as a guy, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, I actually, I haven't developed that work ethic. I haven't developed that discipline. And then people that don't have that, they end up getting stung for it. Now, back in the past, you suffered from the victim mindset. I know your mom, she, she was very angry. I, I can actually re relate to you a lot. My, my father, he grew up with a really angry mother. He was, my dad died when I was 15 years old. And I can pretty much say probably 95% of his entire life with me, he was always angry. Like people didn't want to come to the house. It was very embarrassing. Like people come to your house and your dad's just yelling and screaming and swearing. It's like, dang, I don't want to go by your house. Your dad's like, what's your dad's problem? He's just angry. Right. <laughs> How did you over overcome that? Because especially just like you, I also have two boys and it's very important for us to break that mindset because the thing is, if, if you don't do that, when you have kids, then they start becoming the same way. And Yeah, no, that's a really that good happen. point. So yeah, my mom... Not only was she not an all she had an absolutely abhorrent temper, raging, like category five hurricane when she would get mad. And it was like, oh God, it's happening. Like my sister and I would just try to go hide, but she would oftentimes find us. And yeah, it was, it was not fun to be in her raft. I did 
pick up some of that. And she actually got it from her father, the general I mentioned earlier in World War II. He was actually um, had a, a very bad, he was an alcoholic and had a temper as well. Um, and from what I hear, his mother did as well. So, I, you know, it's goes to that whole nature versus nurture thing. Maybe there's some of it in, it in the genes, but then when you're getting it all the time, it can't help but rub off on you. Sure enough, I had a temper big time growing up, um, especially when I had that chip on my shoulder when I was kind of in rock bottom land mm -hmm. and try, trying to rebuild myself. And I really felt like I just, there was just always, there was this rage in me and I would just absolutely lose it sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's still something to this day that is one of those things that I work on because I've gotten way, way, way better than I used to be. You know, every year it gets better and I work on it. And, um, you know, but it's one of those things where you know, we all have things that we have to, we have to work on and it's about becoming aware of our weaknesses, right? And so to me, it's like, okay, I don't want to yell at my kids. I don't want to yell at my wife. I, and if we get in fights, it's about now it's like, you're going to get in fights with, with your spouse or you, yeah, your kids eventually and your friends. It's, that's part of life. That's something to be ashamed of. It's how you handle it. And it's, it's like, okay, we, and so my wife and I actually, we have these things called agreements where if we, either of us start to get too heated and things start to, we know we're about to say, or, or a word gets said that we shouldn't, we literally just stop what we're doing and it's not easy to do and it takes practice, but, and we just give each other some space and then we come, we either, the one person will either text the other person, like how they're feeling, or, you know, if we wait a long enough period and we both say, okay, we're calm, we get together and we talk about, you know, what was going on in our minds and why we were starting to get heated. But the old us and, and, and definitely the old me before I met her even would just go into a rage and start yelling and, and get into a big fight. I just get in fights with my girlfriends all the time. And if they, if, and if they angered me at any point, I'd just be like, okay, this isn't working, you know? And that's not a way to go through either. You got to fight for it and relationships aren't easy. And I've learned that that's like anything else in life. You got to work for it to earn it and, and to be happy with it. So. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. Cause I, I grew up the same way and it was a blessing for me because I married a woman who's a psychotherapist. Her mom and dad used to argue, but they did in a healthy way. And I didn't realize people can actually argue in yeah. healthy ways without going and screaming yeah. at each other. <laughs> it, 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 that's that's a, right. I, there's a book that's in my head that I want to write. It's called How to Fight Fair. Um, one of these days I'll get around to writing it, but there really are ways to, to get in arguments and, and do it in a constructive way. And, and, you know, like we're all human. If we lose it, it's just how much do you lose it and how much can you walk away and have that emotional intelligence and control your temper and your behavior to where you don't make it way worse. And then if you do lose it, you know, are you apologizing? Are you admitting it? Are you owning up to, you know, your, your mistakes and things you said and did? And it's about apologizing immediately and very sincerely. And you have to be sincere in your apology versus just, oh yeah, sorry, I yelled, you know, whatever. You know, so that's one thing I've learned. And, and we both, we all want that. Like we all want love and we all want to feel good. And if we get yelled at, you know, and it hurts us, we want to know that the other person acknowledges that that was not okay. Um, and then, you know, that goes into the whole, there's a lot of people that are in, in, you know, victimized relationships where they're, they're being abused and they get to the point where they don't even realize that, that they're being verbally abused all the time and even physically because it's so normal to them. And that's really sad. So for someone who is still going through the, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, how and what kind of advice would you give them to break, break out of that? Because that's something that can really change a person's entire life. It's like, if you want to be in a loving, committed relationship, you want to get married, you want to have kids, that's something a person has to break out of. Right. So, you know, and it, you just hit it on the head, you know, it goes to the mindset, the victim versus owner mindset. So at the end of the day, you need to have the mindset of I'm an owner of my life. Everything is within my power and my grasp and I can do whatever I want. And when it comes to relationships, I'm not going to be victimized. I'm not going to let somebody walk all over me. I'm going to stand up for myself at the same time, understanding that it's about growing together and that everybody has different needs, different wants and different tastes. And if you're not saying like rising above to the 10,000 foot view and saying, okay, I respect you. And I want to, and I know I have to make some sacrifices and some compromises to make you happy, but it's worth it for me because when I do that, I know that I'm going to get it back in return and then we're going to grow together versus how many relationships do you see, you know, they do this. It's like, no, I want this. I want this. And it's just like, that's why people get divorced. That's why people are constantly, um, you know, don't, don't, don't make it work. And, you know, marriage just like, it's tough. 
I mean, you're, you're with somebody for, for a long time, especially now during this quarantine, you know, I mean, you're with somebody day in, day and night. I mean, you're going to have arguments. There's going to be little things. They're going to rub you the wrong way and vice versa. Again, it just comes down to how are you handling it and how are you uh, becoming an owner of your life and letting them and encouraging them to be the same both versus both of you becoming victims. Because when both are victims, it's, it's all over. It's like, poor me, this person's being mean to me and I, you know, it's all about me, 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 and they're, they, they're, they're awful and they're mean to me. And if both people are thinking that way, no progress can ever possibly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and the big thing I learned, especially what's going on now with the uh, COVID-19, it's like, if you can get through this, guys, you can get through anything. <laughs> I, I totally agree with that. Now, now, one thing I wanted going back to what you were talking about, your five cores. Why are these things so important? So you have mindset, career and finance, relationships, especially now, uh, physical health, emotional health and giving back. Why are all these five cores so important to you? and should be important to others as well. So as I said, so when I got out of college, you know, or when I'm in college, I kind of started really deciding that I wanted to discover what it is that makes a person happy. Like what is the secret sauce? And it, it took me many, many years of chasing, you know, at first I thought it was career and finances and I kind of put everything into that. And then I, I sacrificed a lot for that. I sacrificed my relationships, my physical health, my emotional health, um, not, not so much my physical health. I always kind of stay, was able to stay in shape and stuff, but I definitely everything else was kind of on the back burner. So when I did have that success, like I said, and I started to approach that and I realized, wow, you know, as I was growing and learning and building my, myself as a person, I realized that how important these other areas were and how less important the, the financial part of it was, but yet that's what like most of us focus on. And so I said, okay, now that I'm out of that game, what do I want to use the rest of my life doing to do? And I decided that it was to help other people see what I've discovered and help them become the best version of themselves so they can in turn pay it forward to help the world become the best version of itself. Because it's a crazy world we're living in. Like I said, I got these two little kids, boys, you've got two boys as well. So we, you, I'm sure you can empathize. I, I want them to go into a, a world that is not completely split in two like it is right now and have hatred and racism and teen suicide at an all time high. Like that stuff scares me. And so if there's anything I can do to help make that better and make people happier, then that's it. That's my mission. And so that's why I decided to do this. And these five cores are what I kind of put together of all these years and thousands of books and seminars and podcasts put together of what I consider the main principles and the main areas of life that if you pay attention to build the right habits in, you will be your happiest and best self. Yeah. Well, and especially talking about physical health. I mean, that's, you can always work on your mindset. You can always work on career and finances, but your physical health, I mean, that's the one thing you especially can't buy no matter how much money and success you have. Your health is the most important thing. I, I think because once that goes pretty much, everything else starts to go. And as, as we've seen here, especially with the COVID-19 virus, it's like a lot of people are being affected, some very wealthy, very famous people. And it's like, hey, you realize, wow, everybody's just like us. I mean, we got to take care of our body. Absolutely. And there's a, you know, the, there is a mind-body connection. So if, you're, if your body, if you're not taking care of your body, your mind is going to suffer. It's very hard to be, to have a growth owner mindset and be like, I can do anything and kick ass and take names and, and there's nothing that can stop me when, you know, you're sitting around eating uh, Doritos all day and you're not moving and you're, you know, being stagnant. You know, it's the, the key to life to me is all about movement, whether it's physical, mental, it's about growth. It's about growing your muscles, your mind. And if you're not doing that, you're going to get, in, you're going to be in trouble and you, you can't be happy. So it's funny, you know, this whole, adage of, you know i just want to like i said i started my journey it was like i just want to be filthy stinking rich and sit on a beach drinking a colada and just show everybody but ironically that's like not even close to happiness like to, to, to become successful and then not do anything with that and just sit around and just drink all day that's literally like the worst thing you can do and it's the number one way to make yourself less happy and you look at people like Elvis. You know, he had, you look at young, when he was young and 
pictures of him dancing and his vitality. I mean, he took the nation by storm because he just had this like charisma and this like this, this human spirit bursting out of every pore. And then later in life, you know, he got that success. It's kind of like we were talking about earlier, like the quarterback in high school, you know, uh, and I don't know how his life played out and how it got to that point. But basically what ended up happening was it was like he was no longer growing. He wasn't growing in his music. He was getting fatter. He wasn't growing physically. Um, he was taking a lot of drugs. So he was trying to numb something, the pain. You know, he obviously wasn't happy. If you're happy, you're, you're not, you don't need to take all these drugs, right? You're naturally high. And so clearly he was suffering and in pain and he just started going down into this, this dark hole. Meanwhile, you know, you're like, this guy has tons of money. He had this unbelievable career. Like he should be the happiest guy on earth, but that's just not how it works. He just, he didn't figure out how to keep growing. Yeah. Well, and that's why my mindset's so important. I was listening to a podcast two days ago as I was going for my, my daily walks and they didn't throw out the name, but there, there's a gentleman, I think he was worth like maybe five or $6 billion. Yeah. It's a lot of money. The guy lost most of it. He still had $1.5 billion left. And guess what he did? He committed suicide because he, the pain of him yeah. losing billions of dollars was so painful. Guy still had $1.5 billion. He forgot what he had. It's like, how can you not live off a billion and a half? But that pain of him losing several billion dollars was so painful that he ended up ending up his life. Like, that's just crazy. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a good example. And that is so con. That's so much more common than you would think. You know, you, people look at people that have money. Everybody wants to have money. And they're like, oh, well, if I have money, it'll solve everything. And it's like, nope, it doesn't. More money, more problems. More money, right? That, that old saying, it's kind of true. Um, and if you don't have these other cores going, and if you're not balancing yourself in your physical, in your relationships, in your emotional health, in your giving, if you're not giving back, and uh, if you're not, you know, firing on all these cylinders and finding that that balance of the things that are really important and make you happy, all the money in the world ain't gonna do anything for you. And then, right, it's when you are obsessed and it becomes all about money, and you're you're in this microcosm and you lose like this guy you're talking about, you have three billion, all of a sudden you let one or one and a half billion. Because your mind is so jaded and shifted in the wrong direction that that feels like you just lost half your soul, right? Meanwhile, a growth owner firing on all five cylinders and all five cores would say, okay, this is what I, this is the amount of money that was my goal. If I, if I get this amount of money, I know that I have everything I need to live, live the life that I want to live, right? Versus more, 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 right? Like I just want more. Well, okay, that guy's got a brand new 2020 jet. My, my jet's 2018, right? It's like, there, it, it sounds funny, but that there's so many people out there like that. And it's like keeping up with the Joneses wanting to, you know, and all, all their focus is, is on money. So that if they lose some of it, no matter how much they have, they're going to be upset. And they think it's making them happy to gain more. But when there's no end or limit, or there's no set goal of like, this is where I want to get to. And it's just, I want more, more, more. It's a never ending, vicious, ugly cycle. I don't wish that on anybody. And I tell you, being a father, that's one of the most rewarding things because it's like, it doesn't matter about money. It doesn't matter about anything. But when you have your child just sitting there looking at you in the eyes and telling you that they love you and giving you hugs and all that stuff, man, it's the most beautiful thing. Nothing better. Uh, I looked, That's funny you say that. This, uh, tonight, I was right before I had my call with you, I was putting my son to bed. And he looked in my eyes and he said, Daddy, I love you. He's four. And, you know, um, it's not, he said, I love you many times before. But tonight, he meant, he really meant it. You know, and just when he looked in my eyes and he said it, like my heart just like melted. I was like, oh my God, I love these two, son. You know, like this is, this is it. This is what life is about. And I feel bad for people that never get to experience stuff like that, where they're chasing that next billion. Yeah, it's truly a beautiful thing. Now, I wanted to ask you, how does momentum affect your life and what is the best way for a person to build momentum? As I was saying earlier, it's all about movement. Right? You're either moving, growing, headed in the right direction, or you're not moving, you're being stagnant, and you're headed in the wrong direction, and you're building negative, and that all ties to momentum. So you're either building positive or negative momentum at all times, in my opinion, and to fire on all five cylinders, which is to basically actively be working on stopping the failure habits in each of these five cores I was telling you about, and replacing them with success habits, that is how you build momentum. Like So for instance, your physical health, what kind of habit, you know, you got to shine a spotlight on your life. What are the habits that you have? Do you, are you a late night snacker? Then you eat, you eat crab at midnight. And then, you know, during the day, 
you're, you know, you're eating junk food and, and whatnot. And maybe you go to the gym, you know, once every couple months or you, but you don't have a routine. Like, you know, these are the things it's like, okay, what's the habit? The cool thing about habits are once they're formed, they're formed. They don't care if they're good or bad work for or against us. Once they've dug their claws in, they're either going to work for or against us. Right. And so if you have a habit, like going to the gym or, or, or working on or playing, like for me, I play basketball um, at the gym. Well, not right now, but normally that's my work. I have to switch my routine, which is something that is super important to be able to pivot to. But um, you, once you, once I develop the routine of, of playing basketball at the gym and then working out after, and I would listen to my podcasts and books on tape and stuff that I was listening to, it felt weird not to do it. Right. That versus had I not gone to the gym in a year, it would have been like pulling teeth trying to get me into the gym. But then once it was formed, it was like automatic. It was like, okay, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I go to the gym. It's like, I don't even think about it. And it's on autopilot. And so you're either building that positive momentum with these habits that you're developing. And to me, that's what it's all about. It's about the habits in our lives. Because we are our habits. Our habits are us. You know, we're going on autopilot a lot of times a day, like the way your mind works and the thoughts that you're having, the actions that you're taking. They're either helping you or hurting you every step of the way. And so they're either going to build positive or negative. Well, one thing I noticed with a lot of people I interviewed, I always have this same thing happens usually in these people's lives. A lot of times people have to hit rock bottom. Like you become morbidly obese and you almost die before you realize, wow, I'm about to die. I need to lose weight. Or you get to the point where you're abusing drugs and then you're like, wow, I'm about to die. I need to stop. Or I'm homeless. Well, I can't live like this anymore. And then you become filthy rich and now you start helping other people. It's like some people, they have to hit the complete rock bottom before they realize I got to wake up or otherwise I'm not going to live very long. That's exactly right. And, and I, I try to, when I talk to people, I tell them, don't, you don't need to be like me, you know, and be, hit your rock bottom. You know, if you haven't hit your rock bottom, just say, look, and I guess the worst thing that can happen to somebody is when they don't hit their, like, I feel fortunate that I did hit mine because it like forced me to like, be like, okay, I got to do And it just lit this fire under me. I got to change things. But it's the people that hover just above rock bottom their whole life. And it's like, it's not so bad that they feel like they really need to do something, but it's, they're not really living a, an amazing life either. They're just sort of hovering there. And that's, those are the people that I feel need the, need the most, you know, cores in their need to understand the cores in their life and say, okay, what, what can I do to sort of start becoming happier one step at a time? And, and if you try to do it all at once, if you try to tackle all your cores and all of a sudden change all your habits, you're not going to do it. You're going to fail and you're going to be like everybody else and just say, okay, well, that was too hard. Forget it. I'm just going to go back. You got to do it one day at a time, one step at a time. Start with one habit or excuse me, one core, one habit within that core and just work on little things a little bit. And then you start to gain that momentum and you start to feel a little bit more confidence. Your perception of the world starts to change. Your attitude starts to change. And as that happens, it becomes easier and easier to build more and more momentum to start changing these other habits and to really start also. The big thing is too, for quite a few people, they ha have these belief systems that they're not even aware of. It's like they believe all these things. Well, all rich people are, are mean and all they do is care about themselves and all these people who are exercising and healthy, they're just vain. And they think of all these things, which are not true based on the belief system of when I was a kid, my mom and dad used to fight over money or my mom and dad didn't like educated people or all these different stories of all these things. And we were, we're not always aware of the way that we think in our mind has nothing to do with us. And we are completely responsible for our own lives and we don't have to be that way. We, we can be our own business owners. We can go to college. There's so many things that we're able to accomplish. It's just we have to be willing to let these these belief systems that don't serve us any well to just go. That's 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 exactly right. And it starts with that first core. Like I said, it's your mindset. It's kind of just understanding that the glass is half full. It's not half empty. And, and so many of us have those negative thoughts and we don't think that we can do it or we're scared and we think, well, if I try and I fail, that means I'm a loser or you know, versus like I said earlier, like if I try and I fail, that just makes me stronger and better. You know, there's just different ways to look at everything. And it's, that's why your mindset, it's literally changing your perception on how you see the world. And if you're able to do that and it doesn't happen overnight, but if you're able to, to take those little steps and learn those habits that are going to help you do that, that's what's going to start kind of shifting everything because as you do that it has a ripple effect throughout all your other cores and your happiness 
and things like i said the momentum just starts to build and then before you know it you're like this unstoppable force and you're like heck yeah i'm doing it and it's there it's just i can't explain the feeling it's so good to go from you know feeling like you're a victim in life and your brain is broken there's nothing you can do about it you are who you are and your lot in life is what it is to basically being like i i, I mean i i'm not bragging but i literally I'm at the stage in my life where I feel like there's nothing I can't do. Like if I really want to do something, I can do it. And this is what I've decided to do with it. And it's been a journey. I mean, I've been doing this for like the last year and I'm trying to build my own momentum and getting people to get with the more, with the momentum movement and understand what it is and, and get the message out there. I've learned a lot. I've had a lot of failures um, and, and things not to do. And just like any other business, any other thing I'm learning and growing and I'm excited. And every failure that I have, I'm like, okay, I learned what not to do there. I'm going to keep going. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. <laughs> it's all about the way you, you think of things. So as a business leader, what are some questions that you ask yourself? And what are some things that you think daily? Every morning, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, it's not so much questions I ask myself, but it's, remind, it's things that I remind myself of. So every single morning, I say my mantra. I, I do. It's called Habit Stacking. There's this great book by James Clear. Fantastic. He talks about different ways to make sure that these habits stick and that you develop them and you keep them. And habit stacking is one of them where you're already doing something and then you combine it with the habit that you want to do. So when I'm taking my shower, I actually stretch because I need to, I tore my ACL earlier last year. And so I have to constantly be stretching and I hate doing it. But if I'm doing it while I'm in the shower and I'm repeating my mantra to myself, I don't even notice it, right? It's a habit now. I just do it. I don't even think about it. Um, and then my mantra is basically full of the things it's got my five cores in there and it's got the things that I personally know that I want to remind myself every single day. That's going to help me become the bigger, biggest, best, fastest, strongest version of myself. And I literally say it, I've memorized it and I wrote, I wrote it years and years ago. I've tweaked it over the years, but now it's to the point where I've memorized it and I finish it. And then I end it with what I'm grateful for. And then I basically take a deep breath. I let it all sink in. I breathe out and I'm ready to start my day. And that just fuels my day with rocket fuel. So I'm ready to go after that. For a person who, it's something that we always told us, like you become what you think and you have to believe all this stuff and you should say all this positive stuff. But it's not going to do anyone any good if they don't believe it. So for a person who's listening right now and like, you know, I want to become successful. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have kids. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to do this. How can they do that if they don't believe it? What is some things that you would suggest to that type of person? Because that's the thing you have to believe it. That's very important. Right. Well, that belief, again, that goes back to it's, it's shifting your mindset from a victim to an owner. If you don't believe it, you're still a victim. When you're an owner, it means growth. I call it a big fixed victim versus a growth owner. So a fixed victim is somebody that basically says, my brain is the way it is. I was born how I am. My lot in life is this. Why even bother trying? Because I'm probably going to fail and that's going to be hard on my ego. So versus a growth owner says, I was born the way I was born. I have strengths and weaknesses just like everybody else. I'm going to figure out workarounds around my weaknesses. I am going to take the strengths that I have and figure out exactly what those are and how to harness them and use them to propel myself. I'm going to set goals and I'm going to make it happen and temporary roadblocks waiting for solutions. So if I do come upon them, I'll find workarounds. And if they halt me in my tracks, I'll learn from them and then I'll work around them. And that really is the difference. And it sounds simple when I describe it. It's not easy to get to that point. But like I said, if you can get to that point, like I feel like I'm at in my life, it isn't anything that can, that can stop me. It's a pretty cool place to be. And if, trust me, if I could do it, being, being from my, I want to go from my rock bottom where I was, I mean, I was the biggest loser in high school. I had no friends. I was always picked on. I was 160 pounds soaking wet, six foot three, just gangly awkward. Um, and, you know, I, I basically kind of say, you know, if I could kind of transform myself, the way that I did, anybody can. And, but you don't have to go through 25 years of like reading self-help books and taking these laws of the unit and trying to figure it out yourself. To me, that's part of what I feel like I offer people um, is I can help you. I can say, look, I, 
I'm not a wizard or, or a god, but I feel like I'm pretty confident that there's universal principles that have been around since the beginning of time, and they're going to be around until the end of time. And if you can use those in your life and build habits around them, you will be happy. And that's, that's kind of what I want to help show people. It's not rocket science. I think you mentioned earlier. It's not super complicated. It's principles. Um, let's see. There's a quote that I love about principles. Um, I can't think of it, but <laughs> the gist is principles. Life, oh, life is complicated. Principles are not. Those principles that I've learned in my path, that I, I've kind of, through blood, sweat, and tears, used myself as a human science experiment, read all these books and all this stuff, and come together with these principles that I now feel are really the, the, the main ones that you want to build your life and your habits around. And I want to share those with people and help them, use, have them use them so that you know, they don't have to go searching in all these different directions like I do and have 25 years spent trying to figure it all out. Yeah, and the truth is, if everybody in the world was happy, we would all live in a perfect world. I mean, it'd be amazing. It'd be safe for all of our kids to live in a world that was like that. It'd be a beautiful thing. It is possible. That's exactly it. Now, with the current COVID-19 virus, just heard Mark Cuban a while ago. He said recently, big businesses often begin in the times of chaos. Do you agree with this? Absolutely. Yeah. Another uh, person who I, I really admire, Warren Buffett, I think is the one who said when there's blood on the streets is when you want to buy stock market related. But similar concept, you know, when, when there's bad things happening and everybody else is freaking out and the herd's going one way, if you can gather yourself, look for the opportunity in it and go the other way, then you can really knock it out of the park. There's a lot of opportunity out there for sure. Well, I, I think too, like, especially now, a lot of people who thought that their careers went to college and work at this big firm or whatever, and things are just great and they couldn't be, be any better. And so many, was it tens of millions of people being laid off and furloughed from their job, they're realizing, dang, my job isn't as safe as I thought it was. Maybe I need to start my own business. And now is probably a great time to do that for some of these people. Absolutely, yeah. You know, I mean, this. I think this is gonna shift the way that people look at the world. It's already shifting. Um, this, the way people look at the world, speaking of mindset, you know, and technology and what's happening in terms of people being forced to work at home, if they're fortunate enough to work at home. Some people, you know, their jobs don't translate to home and it's, I, I feel really bad and it's really extra tough for them. But for people that are realizing they can work from home, they're, they're saying, wow, I can get just as much done as I did in the office. I think on the flip side, the offices, these corporations are saying, wait a minute, we don't have to have these big, huge office buildings and pay all this rent and all these benefits. We can have these people working from home and they do work in, in half the time. They get twice as much done and they're not chatting at the water cooler. Or doing it. So it's kind of a win-win in a lot of ways. And I think that it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out in terms of which businesses end up thriving and which ones kind of get knocked out. And, you know, it's Darwin. It's survivalism. It's, law, it's survival of the fittest, you know, and it's sort of like there's businesses that have maybe been around for too long that are time, you know, like malls, for instance. I don't think all malls should go away, but I feel like malls kind of have had their place. And and now it's like it's the Amazons of the world and, and, and stuff. And, you know, there's just so much opportunity within all of these, these new realms, right? And so you've got to make sure you're not being stuck in the past and trying to hold on to a dying industry or a dinosaur and say, okay, well, what's the new trends and what's shifting and how can I take advantage of that? That's how you're, you're going to become successful. And you got to try to put your head in a space of, okay, where are we going to be five years based on what's happening and what I'm saying, we're going to be five years from now, not playing catch up, trying to follow the guy in front of you that's trying to do it. Well, especially for somebody who, if people are going to graduate very soon, what, it's almost May. So at the end of May, a lot of people will be graduating from college. And then also in the summer and towards the fall, what kind of advice would you give to any college students right now who are about to graduate college? And you know, they're kind of scared. There's, there's not any certainty right now in their careers. What, what, what's some kind of advice you'd give, give those young students? So I actually, I, I'm working with a few mentees from my college, Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida. Um, I was honored to be able to go back there recently. I got an award from them, a Career and Champions uh, Mentorship Award. The people who have gone on had success and then are also now trying to help do good things. And I went in and I met some students there and I'm continuing to ment mentor them. And so the advice that I've been giving them is the same I would give anybody else, which is 
going back to what I said earlier, you know, you got to figure out what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. We all have weaknesses. It's nothing to be ashamed of, but make sure, you know, you figure out, especially now in day and age, you can find workarounds around them. Like there's Upwork, there's outsourcing. There's so many ways that you, like for me, I'm extremely ADD. And for years I was ashamed of that. And, but now it's like, I know that there's certain things I'm good at and then I focus on and then I outsource all the other stuff. I've got like six or seven team members. I've never met any of them. They're all over the country and they're working virtually. And so to me, you know, it's figuring out what you're good at and workarounds around your weaknesses and then what you're really good at, making sure that's what you're spending the majority of your time doing and setting up a system to succeed and setting goals. Goals are so important and they're so underrated. I mean, everybody's like, oh yeah, goals are good. But it's like, how many people actually set goals? Without goals, you're just a, 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 rudder, a ship without a rudder. You're just kind of like, wherever the wind's blowing you, it's like pulling you over here, it's pulling you over here. But when you have a goal and you have exactly where you want to be in a certain time frame, that's how you're going to get there. Because then you start taking the actions, building the steps. Okay, what is it going to take to get there? And every day you're pivoting around and figuring out the best way to do so versus just being like, oh, I want to be successful. Okay. Well, how? By, by watching Netflix 10 hours a day, by being pulled this way, that way, you got to have goals. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty much common sense when we think about it. anybody who's in college, what's the first thing that they give you usually in the first or second day of school syllabus is? They give you syllabus so you have some kind of plan, some idea of how this course is going to go. And that is the reason why those classes are successful, just like a business or as, as with anything, if you want to lose weight, whatever it is, you need some kind of plan, some, something to follow. You just, I'm going to do it. You probably never will. You've got to have a plan. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. You've got to, you've got to have a plan and it's, it, it blows my mind. I mean, I won't even go on. I have a whole section in my book about, I do think the system's broken. I feel like the schooling system is still focusing on the wrong things where we're using a system where we're teaching the same things from a hundred years ago, as much as our society has evolved, we're still using the one classroom model, which was, you know, pioneered 200 years ago. Um, it, it, it's, it's crazy to me and we're learning we're not learning the basics of how to get along with others how to balance our checkbooks how to set goals like these are things that should be just ingrained in you by the time you get to high school or get out of high school even and uh you know i took i think i took my first i learned about goals i took a course like just this off-site course in college and i just happened to learn about goals and some of that i didn't know what they were but nobody ever really sat down and was like this is how you do it this is you know and that, that kind of changed my, my whole perspective on things. And I'm like, wow, if I hadn't taken that course, I wonder what would happen. Yeah, I agree. I was reading something today. Warren Buffett was saying one of the most important things you can ever learn in life if you want to be a successful business person or investor, you have to know accounting. That's what he said, no accounting. Yeah. Well, again, to me, I'm not good with numbers. I'm good enough. But I can outsource that. Like I, I use QuickBooks. Um, I have people that help me. You know, I have an accountant that helps me at the end of the year with, with the money part of it. I know enough to know that you know, money's more money has to come in than is going out, and I know how to structure my businesses in such a way. But my old business partner was really good at accounting, and he was the numbers guy. And we used to joke, it was like, "I'm the yin, he's the yang." Is like I was really creative and the big visionary, and was coming up with the great ideas and and helping making sure they were getting executed. And then he was kind of like the little detail guy and making sure the numbers were in place and where they were supposed to be. And again, it was like, I realized that was one of my weaknesses. So I found a partner that had that. So no, I don't think everybody necessarily has to be awesome at accounting or, or have that affinity for numbers as long as they know, are aware of it and can find a workaround. Around. Now, a question I was going to ask you, speak of money. If one day your bank account went to zero, and you had to start all over again, what would be your first action and what would be your action plan and the layout you would use to build up your empire again? That's a loaded question, but I'll <laughs> give you a, I'll, I'll give you the, the one minute version. I would take everything that I've learned becoming an entrepreneur the first time around. And it's, it's kind of really what I'm doing right now. I mean, I started from scratch this past year. I sold my other business. Um, the difference is I do have money to help me sustain myself with mode right now. But, you know, again, it's about kind of if I didn't have any money, it would be just the same advice I just gave. What are my how can I use the strengths that I have? How can I figure out how to work around the weaknesses and then set goals and figure out what I'm super passionate about, like really revs my engines and 
just go full speed ahead and don't take no for an answer. And obstacles are temporary roadblocks. When you fail, learn from it, grow. And you know what? There might be days you're eating ramen noodles. I, I, I went through those days. And I'll tell you, without one of my favorite sayings, without the bitter, the sweet, you're staying sweet. If you don't go through those tough times, then when you get to the other side and you do have the success, it ain't nearly as awesome. So, you know, don't feel like if you are struggling or you're young or you're trying to start a business, I mean, obviously you got to pay the rent and you, know, you can't be living out on the street. And I, the way I tell people, it's like, don't be afraid of a side hustle. You know, if you've got a job and you need to pay the bills, if you really want it and you really want to become a success and, and grow a business or you have an idea, you got to do it on the side. And the word can't, can't be part of your vocabulary. You know, oh, I'm tired when I get home, right? You got to find the time. When I was doing doorstep in the beginning, I was working 12 to 15 hour days, seven days a week. And that's to, to start a successful business. I don't care what people tell you. Kim Kardashian, you know, she woke up and it looks like she just had zillions of dollars thrown on her. You know, and there are always examples of people that, you know, that internet kid is 19 and he's making all this money. There's always going to be like one in a zillion examples of people that kind of just did step into the gold. But for 99.9% .9 of everybody else, you have to develop the discipline and you got to work hard and it's not easy. That's the thing. These people are not people who just only worked eight hours a day and that's all they would work. They work. Right. Any really successful entrepreneur, none of them will say, oh yeah, Monday through Friday, nine to five. And then I checked out. <laughs> not how it works. Exactly. So, Will, for those who are listening right now and want to support you in your mission and making the world a better place, what can people do to support you and how can people find you online, Will? So, my website is www.more, M O O R E, Momentum. More is my last name. So, moremomentum.com. Um, that's got links to my, my website, or excuse me, my social media. Um, there's a, a fun quiz you can take. So, we've been talking about these five cores. Uh, there's an actual quiz you can take at the top. It'll say, what's your core score? And it'll ask you some questions and you fill out the, and basically it'll kind of give you a sense of where you stand in each of your five core areas. Um, and then I would suggest following me on social media. I'm starting to do my own podcast. I'm starting to do more interviews. I'm interviewing other people as well. And just kind of showing people how to use, to practically use these things that I'm talking about, these habits and using these cores and making sure that you're building positive momentum. And all of this is leading up to the book and the app that I have coming up, coming out um, hopefully in the next year. And the app, the, the book will be about my life story and these five cores and how you can use them and the habits and, and kind of getting the whole feel of what it takes to use them and connecting with them and understanding why it makes sense. And then the app, will actually be a really fun, cool, interactive way to make sure you're firing on all five cylinders. So you're this rocket ship and you've got these five cores and these cores are each of the cylinders of your engine. So you've heard me mention several times, firing on all cylinders. So the idea is each one of these rockets is your core and you've got to continually balance and build momentum in each of them to fly up. And as you go, you're gaining speed, you actually will be going to different planets. You'll be going to different solar systems, different galaxies. You'll be meeting aliens along the way. You'll be upgrading your ship. And as the whole point is, as you're actually leveling up on screen, you're also leveling up in real life. So the whole point is it's gamified and it's addictive, just like a social media or one of these games that has no value that's going to bring to your life to actually help you. But this one actually does help you. So I'm super excited about that. I'm, I can't wait till it's done and I want to share it with the world. But in the meantime, yeah, just check out my website and follow me on social media. Is, is that going to be for kids as well? It's going to be more for, I mean, could a kid technically use it? Yes. And eventually I do want to have a kid version and I want to have actually a kid version of my book as well. Because as I said earlier, you know, the earlier you start with this stuff, the better. These habits, they, they dig in deep. And once they're clawed in, it's hard to undo them. It's a front-loaded process. You can undo them. But why not start early and start developing these habits as soon as possible? So, yes, that's something that I have a, a plan to do in the future. Yeah, because that would be really good because, as you know, kids are so addicted to technology. They're always using their tablets. They use them at school. They're using them at home. And anything, if you're going to be obsessed with something, hey, let it be a, be a, be an obsessed and always using something that's going to be good for your mind as well, because that'd be great for kids, because it'll be fun. And at the same time, they'd be learning stuff without them even realizing 
wow, this is actually making me stronger. This is helping me change my mindset in a positive way and believe, yes, I can. Yes, I can. Because even with my kids, my, my son being seven and 10, you know, in school, sometimes they're like, I can't do this, dad. I can't do this. I'm like, yeah, you can. You do it all the time. Okay. That's right. Yeah, it's so true, right? I mean, and, and the youth of today, you know, I mean, my, who, my target market and the people I'm trying to talk to, it's everybody, but especially, you know, these kids that are, that are coming out of college or in high school or in their young 20s or, or, you know, that are trying to figure out who they are. Like you asked earlier, coming out of college, what would you recommend? Um, it's so hard. To, there's so many people, and especially now in day and age with all these things coming at you from a million directions, where this instant generation where you've got the news and the media and your peers and, and your cell phones and your TVs and multi tablets. Knowing what to listen to and what to act on is so tough these days. And so, yeah, I think that using an app, which they're already kind of addicted, their phones are already addicted to anyways, to help them versus hurt them, I think is going to be a neat thing. Thank you so much, Will. Thank you. Your time. No, I really enjoyed this. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks for having me on. And um, You're very welcome. hopefully we'll stay in touch and, and we can help build some momentum together. Johnny here. Thank you for listening to the Power Your Voice podcast. I would absolutely love to get your feedback on this episode and how it impacted you. Reach out to me on Instagram by sending a direct message to username Voice Podcast. If someone in your life could benefit from this episode, share it with them and check out thepowerofyourvoice.com to read blogs on each podcast episode and learn more about what was discussed. And please leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. This lets me know you find this show valuable. And thank you for listening.